Hi everybody, I'm Jim Carroll. Earlier this year, the broadband industry passed a significant milestone with the installation of the 600 millionth residential broadband connection. According to the Broadband Forum and Point Topic, the majority of these connections are DSL-based, increasingly VDSL fed by fiber. The technology continues to improve as well. So to get a better understanding of where DSL is headed next, I had the opportunity to sit down with the inventor of DSL, Dr. John Chaffee, whose pioneering work with discrete multi-tone technology became the enabler of digital subscriber line connections. In 1991, Dr. Chaffee founded Amadi Communications, which was later acquired by Texas Instruments. In addition to his role as Professor Emeritus at Stanford University, Dr. Chaffee has gone on to found another innovative startup in this space, ASIA, which specializes in dynamic spectrum management technology for DSL networks. He holds over 100 patents in the field, and he's also the recipient of the IEEE Alexander Graham Bell Award for outstanding contributions to telecommunications. DSL is, is actually very healthy on a, on a global basis. There's a little more than 400 million paying subscribers uh, for DSL service around the world, and that has been continuously growing um, over really the last eight or nine uh, years at a pretty pretty state uh, pretty steady pace. It should get to at least about 600 million in the la next uh, couple of years. A lot of the growth is in Asia, um, uh, South America, developing uh, markets, if, if you will, for it. Um, it is by far the dominant uh, fixed line uh, mechanism for broadband. It's about 70 percent of all um, broadband uh, connections, and the 70 percent is still growing, so it's still gaining on both. Uh, uh, fiber and, and cable. You don't often get that impression here in the Bay Area because there's a, a more significant competition between uh, Comcast and AT&T, obviously as a cable and, uh, and uh, DSL su uh, suppliers, but on a worldwide basis, um, uh, is, cable is a very tiny fraction, a, a, as is fiber as well. It is still expanding. Uh, the, the, the market data is pretty clear. We, we track it um, every quarter uh, from the professionals who do this, and we actually break out. An important point to remember is VDSL is a DSL. You'll see, you know, uh, AT&T, for instance, will give a separate number for DSL and for UVerse. The UVerse is VDSL, so it's VDSL. So they're, they're net, they're net DSL are adding uh, at AT&T, but from a positioning standpoint, they may want to call it something different. Um, uh, given the competition that they have, but uh, certainly uh, it's a high-speed uh, DSL universe. It's been, you know, on a, in a general sense, pretty spectacular. I think wireless has probably grown even faster yet, but it's certainly, if you take that, you know, that growth away from the picture, it's been a very healthy uh, growth curve, uh, even through bad economies and so forth. They continued to sp expand the last. Uh, 12 or 13 years. I've always had a strong belief in copper versus fiber, and we can go into that later if you like, but the, the uh, you know, the, 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 the cost of deploying a fiber, especially all the way to, to someone's residence, is very high, several thousand dollars per customer. I think it's pretty clear now. And so the return on investment for that has just never made sense. Fiber makes great sense in the network between high, you know, congestion points and such. It's a nice technology. So. Um, but even I was surprised at, at, at how cogent that, 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 um, that copper argument is and how long it's, it's held true. It's held true for more than 30 years now, and, and there's really no end in sight from a practical standpoint on the difference on the return on investment. And now the DSLs are running you know, 100, 100 megabits per second and more, uh, so we'll see more and more of that in the future. So it's, it's handling uh, the broadband need. From the beginnings in the late 80s when we got serious about subscriber uh, residential uh, uh, digital connections and what could be done beyond just digital voice uh, connectivity, which was the old ISDN, which was not really much of a success uh, at the time. But as we began to look at data and video and other types of applications flowing uh, to the, the consumer, um, uh, in the beginning people were looking at a few megabits per second, the original ADSL1 which is standardized in 1993, 
Uh, I, I actually did the design for that. It was uh, the concept, the asymmetry, was invented at Telcordia, a guy named Joe Le Lecklider. But I did the original designs, and he was the one who talked me into that. We got the asymmetry ratios correct uh, for broadband, and it ran up to about 8 megabits per second. Within a few years of, of that, we were already trying to improve that, so I, I was working on what was called VDSL. We introduced the concept um, and extending really what ADSL does on shorter lines, so being able to go to 25 or 50 uh, megabits per second. So uh, by the early uh, 2000s, you see that standardized as well. Um, and then the uh, whole dynamic spectrum management area you know, commenced around uh, 2000, 2001. That continues to improve. It looks at the context of many DSL subscribers all interfering with one another. ADSL and VDSL to that point had only looked at each you know, doing the best they can without regard to their, their effect on, on all of the others. And that's a, that's a big effect. And so that was that last step that gets you into the 100 megabits, even gigabit per second DSLs if you use a few, uh, few uh, twisted pairs in parallel with one another for one customer, you can get up to those, those speeds. Well, the, the big event that, that, uh, that I remember sticks out in, in my mind was in early 1993. Um, the, the, the concept that, that, that I introduced for, for, for DSL, ADSL in particular, was um, each of the billion uh, telephone lines around the world is very different. They have different noises, different lengths, different effects that are ongoing. Uh, and that range of variation it was just unlike any communications channel that had come before by three orders of magnitude. So you needed to have a very adaptive approach. So the equipment itself has to kind of look at the channel and say, what's going on here? Talk to one another. They have a little kind of command channel between the two modems at the central office and your DSL modem at home. And they talk to one another on that command channel. They tell, you know, hit me here, don't hit me there, that type of thing. So that, that had to become very adaptive. That hadn't been done before. Uh, so that was, that was very controversial uh, at the time. A lot of people said it wouldn't work or it wouldn't work any better than, than any of the existing more static techniques. And it was a big playoff that they had, uh, the so-called Olympics of DSL back in uh, early 1993. And the, the test showed that we were correct. This was a massive increase in terms of performance, four times the data rate at the same length or an extra couple of miles at the same speed. Uh, so um, it was a big effect and with a lot of excitement. And that's what gave birth really to ADSL and its opportunity up to say 8 megabits, maybe a, a mile and a half or longer was the, uh, the uh, ranges considered. Um, then people start talking about video, they wanted to go even faster, uh, 25, 50 megabits per second. So then VDSL was introduced around 94, 95 time frame. It was controversial at first. It did require some fiber to be deployed so you could shorten the loops more to 3,000 feet or so. And a lot of uh, telephone lines are, are longer than 3,000 feet. So uh, a, a service provider would have to pay to put fiber to within a few thousand feet. Now that's a lot cheaper than putting it all the way to the customer. If it costs you a million dollars to put that fiber in, you get to divide it by a thousand customers, and it's a thousand dollars each. If you have to divide it by one customer, you know, it's, it's just not going to be viable to do. Um, so by early 2000s, you started to see that start to happen uh, in various parts of the world. VDSL today is still maybe about 20% of the DSL market, but it's growing rapidly. And, and the example I gave earlier, if, if you have them comparing VDSL, calling it under another name, that's growing, and the DSL is declining. Well, that's because they're switching from the lower speed and going to the higher speed. But the, the net number is actually uh, increasing still uh, throughout the world. We're going to see a, a couple of things happen. The, the, the dynamic spectrum management is still in its first phases, so so-called vectored uh, DSLs, uh, which allow you to get more like 100 megabits at a kilometer. Previously, it was 25 to 50 megabits per second at that range. Uh, those are coming into the market. They need to be managed to do that. It becomes very sensitive, uh, but certainly that can be done. The, the phantom DSLs that take two or more twisted pairs, it's four wires when you do that because each has two wires in it. It's actually three channels in there if you think about it for a second. So they make a nice lift too and you can get even higher speeds uh, further uh, 
uh, with the, the system get to several hundred megabits per second, which nobody needs other than maybe small businesses and such. So that's called phantom uh, vector DSL. So um, there's a lot of, uh, of bandwidth left in the copper if you can get to fiber within a kilometer or so. But even, even beyond that, uh, Jim, the, the um, uh, Wi-Fi has proliferated uh, throughout the world. It's about 700 million access points, so even larger than, than DSL. Many of the Wi-Fi's are at the end of a DSL. Uh, obviously, you, you probably have that. If you have DSL service, you probably have a Wi-Fi uh, gateway uh, in, your, in your modem box. And what you begin to see is the overlapping coverage of all these Wi-Fi's. Okay, so if your smartphone is offloading or your tablet is offloading, you could actually collect the signals from several of those Wi-Fi's, which are all fed by DSLs. And so what you get is a really interesting comparison. If you're looking in a neighborhood and you were to take a couple hundred megabits on this DSL and a couple hundred megabits on your neighbor's DSL and you start adding those up, you actually get a higher bandwidth than you get on a pond because it's only a single strand of fiber. And I don't think this was anticipated in the early days of, of pond. It's much more expensive. But unless you go to multiple wavelengths, which nobody's talking about, that's very expensive on fibers, only between the big switches that they would do that. Uh, you actually have a net bandwidth that's higher because you have many copper twisted pairs that now, you know, through the benefit of Wi Fi, if you start to share with your neighbors the various approaches to that, you can actually get a very, very high speed with a minimal investment by the service provider in terms of equipment. It's basically you know, some enhanced modems and, and Wi-Fi that allow a little bit of uh, coordination and you're, you're on your way to uh, everything you would need. So um, there's a tremendous opportunity and, and, um, to, to get to many hundreds of megabits per second basically to any uh, you know, broadband subscriber out there, including you know, the, the offloading to the, to the um, smartphones, tablets, your IPTV is going to be on a Wi-Fi connection or, or even, you know, maybe it's bland these days, but your PCs, <laughs> you know, your, your laptops throughout the, uh, the, uh, the residence or business, whatever. Users today, consumers, especially in more advanced areas, you, you see statistics like if they have to wait more than four seconds for the file to download, they, get, they abandon. You know, if uh, you look at some of the major uh, uh, applications, if, if it takes an extra half a second or quarter second, they lose some huge amount of money uh, at, the, at the search engine companies or at the online vendors of, of a variety of bartering online and so forth. Uh, delay uh, is, is, is an issue and, and the more data we have flowing, especially the more video data uh, that's flowing, the larger uh, the amount of data that flows and so uh, the need is growing. And, and uh, the, the wireless mobile data growth is tremendous. Um, and it can't be accommodated by licensed spectrum uh, out there. It's the Wi-Fi's. There's a little small cells that really have that, that spectrum. It's unlicensed, it's free, and that's where you see everything going. And you, you probably do this several times a day yourself where you're offloading with your smartphone or your tablet to a, to a Wi-Fi because you're, you're getting a better experience on it. It largely targets noises. Copper, a copper twisted pair by itself with no noise has a very high bandwidth. You can even purchase 10 gigabit ethernet today if you have a very clean connection. Um, it's a noise that limits that, uh, that bandwidth. Um, and of course the length as well. But if you can reduce the noises, then you can get a much higher speed. So vectoring technology has a couple of things that are, are necessary. Um, some of the noise is the other users that are in the same cable. And so it's possible because they terminate at the same place, or most of the lines terminate at the same place. It's one-sided cancellation. It's either pre-cancellation if you're the transmitter or post-cancellation if you're a receiver. But you can eliminate uh, much of the interference from the other users. So your data rate goes up. Now there's other noises present that, that, that can't quite be eliminated by that same technique. Lighting systems, refrigerators, uh, even television sets create uh, noises that get almost any kind of electronic appliance. But there are ways uh, of managing that, canceling that, reducing it also. That's the dynamic spectrum management aspect of, of, uh, of vectoring uh, as well. If you put those two together, that's how you get you know, from, let's say, 25 megabits to 100 megabits per second is reducing uh, those noises in, in the system. Uh, 
it doesn't have to be a whole note at once. There's a misconception of that. But it is a, it's a sequence of steps where you can incrementally start to reduce the amount of noise that any one connection sees. And as the noise is reduced, on average, the speed goes up. And so uh, that's what dynamic spectrum management is about, is, is taking advantage of these multi-user interactions uh, and any other information you can get to further the speeds on DSL. So it's not a violation of any fundamental law of physics. It's basically just exploiting many things that had never been originally exploited uh, in DSL. Some of the major equipment vendors announced the Vector Ready um, uh, equipment. Uh, that's happened over the last uh, year or so. Uh, the management of that equipment is something that Asia sells with its products. We're probably the top company in the world in terms of, of sales of uh, dynamic spectrum management products. We have about 60 million um, lines that we manage already around the world, and that's, that's growing uh, still, still rapidly. So, uh, you know, both sides of what you need are, are, are coming into the marketplace. Uh, and now it's, a lot of it is still in kind of test and trials on the, the higher ends, the 100 megabits and beyond. Many of the earlier techniques are already in place on the 60 million uh, customers already. Well, yeah, c carriers are... are um, strained in the wireless area by competition. So they, their, their, their revenues, even though the amount of data being passed may be going up, their revenues have been uh, somewhat flat unless they're adding a lot more customers uh, to the service. And so they have a fixed amount of capital and they have to make a trade-off between how much they invest in the wireless uh, equipment and, and activities and how much they invest in fixed line. Um, but the smart ones are balancing that because the fixed line, the offloading, is absolutely crucial to the wireless success in the future. So if you go all wireless and you don't have a way somehow either through your own network or relationships on other networks or, or ways to, to essentially unbundle uh, the, the bandwidth, uh, you're, you're going to have an issue uh, in terms of how you grow your, your speeds. One of the, the areas that ASIA works on is trying to make that additional bandwidth that we're adding in the copper available to anyone. It's kind of an electronic unbundling, if you will, type of concept that we're introducing into the marketplace, which is, which is pretty interesting stuff. Instead of the regulator unbundling, if you can increase the speed of that link, and most of the service providers have already sold up to some speed, and they're well below that speed that they sold up to. If you can improve that, change something, some, uh, download some software into the customer equipment, and speed up the connection, um, that's new bandwidth that, that now many can take advantage of. So there's a lot of different ways of, uh, of exploiting this, but the fixed line network is absolutely crucial to the future of wireless. You have to go to small cells. Wi-Fi or, or femtocell, whatever it is, you have to go that. There's not enough spectrum. And as you go there, you have to have a wire to each of the cells. If you don't have that wire, you're out of business. You have, to, you have to get it somehow, either leasing or partnerships or owning it yourself. There are a number of different ways, but you, you can't ignore that. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. <laughs> You're welcome, Jim.